I'll, I'm going to start by saying I've been on an awful lot of expeditions around the world and have seen just absolutely amazing, amazing animals and amazing places. And one of the hardest things is coming back, because normally I have to come through LAX, and you can imagine what that would feel like. But, but the, um, the thing I realize is how small we have sort of turned our world into. I mean, the whole idea of micro dogs and micro chips and mini lattes and nanopods, you know, it, it just astounds me every single time I come back. And the fact that your jobs, most of our jobs are in these little cubicles or in offices, or that you've created cubicles, sort of vir virtual cubicles, in your mind with computers and with iPods and with cell phones, you know, it's, it's almost hard to take. And it's one of those things that we've sort of forgotten in all of this mini technology, the elephant that is actually standing all around you. I love showing this picture to my mother. She's like, what the heck are you thinking when you're, when you're doing this kind of thing? But in that process, in that process of our world just getting so small and so closed, we are losing um, most of the big animals of, of the world. We know a little bit about this cat, um, but in terms of any of those other big felines that are in that picture, we really know very, very little. Our science has gotten so small, we've concentrated on the molecular, the cellular, the nanoparticles that we're missing the big animals. And we've gotten to a point that 50% um, of all mammalian species are in population decline. Yeah, that's a remarkable number. And that the number of endangered species year after year after year increases. And you can think that it's global warming, you can think that it's habitat destruction, bad genetics, whatever you want to call it. But the truth of the matter is, from my perspective, is that we have just gotten to a point of thinking too small. So my goal today is to try and get you to get out of your cubicle, get to a point where you start thinking big, and it's sort of like preaching to the choir here, but you know, we've got to get to a point where we're in this big, big world that we're all a part of. And I want to tell you a little bit about um, an experience I had that brought me into that big world of animals, and it happened in Hawaii. It was one of the first jobs that I had and it was to do a necropsy on a whale, a sperm whale, that had come up on the beach in Kauai in front of the $350 a night room at the Sheraton <laughs> Kauai. Um, and you know, to the dismay of the manager, we said, we're going to necropsy this whale. And, <laughs> and we proceeded to do that, but it was one of the most amazing experiences about big. Because here you have this animal, he was 30-some uh, feet long, giant sperm whale, lying there right in front of me. And we started looking at the various pieces inside of that animal. And so we looked at its heart. The heart of this animal was 300 pounds. I mean, it's a massive thing. It weighs as much of a, as a refrigerator. And it must have thundered when it beat. It was just the most amazing, amazing organ. And then its brain. Its brain was 18 pounds. Now, you think you may have a big brain, but the human brain is about three pounds. This animal had an 18-pound brain, and it is the biggest brain of anything living or extinct, anything in Jurassic Park, anything that um, has ever lived is diminished in terms of this animal, in terms of brain size. And if you listen to the background right now, you sort of get the sense, this is the heartbeat of a whale. And while my heart rate is probably 150 right now, your, <laughs> yours is about 70 if you're in good shape. And the whale's heartbeat, even when it's swimming around, is about 30 beats per minute, and then can get down to four and 10 beats per minute when the animal is on a dive. The intestines of an animal like this, 175 yards long, it would go out this room and into the parking lot. If we went to the Washington Monument, it would span the entire Washington Monument. It was so huge. It was just an enormous animal. And the amazing thing was that here's this 20-ton animal on the beach, and we could find nothing the matter with it. It seemed totally healthy. 
Except for one thing. Um, I lost the bet, and my next job was to feel into the stomach of this whale and just see what the contents were. So the other two guys that were working with me cut a slit about this big in the side of the whale because we didn't want the stuff spilling out onto the sand and I had to reach in. So I have sort of a, a prop here. But I had to reach into this whale stomach and you can imagine that you're there and it was dark and I'm going, please don't let it be parasites. I don't want it to be worms, whatever it is. And I felt something hard and I'm going, oh, Lord, please. And I, in one single moment, in one move, this is what I pulled out. And so what was in the stomach of that whale was netting and filament line and ropes. In fact, we pulled out 10 balls of this stuff. The animal obviously had been uh, swallowing these things. This was the culprit. This is why the animal died. And I was astounded. Why would an animal with an 18-pound brain eat something like this? And so I did a couple of experiments. This is a human view of what you've got. There's actually three squid, which is a favored prey items of these whales. And um, the, you can't see them because you've got filament line on top and you've got sort of netting on the bottom. Here's the whale view. The whale never saw it. The whale, because of its X-ray sonar type sensory system, when it looks at this kind of filament line, when it looks at this kind of netting, never even sees it in the water. And so that's why it ate all of that netting. It never saw it because the only thing it ever saw was those squid. And that changed my life. In that singular moment with the blood of a whale mixing in the sand, actually this is perfect, you know, <laughs> but it was, yeah, this blood was mixing in the sand, I've got an arm that's covered in the viscera of that whale, and I realized I had to change my science. I had to think as big as I could, and I had to start seeing the world through animal eyes and see what it was that allowed them to survive. And so I started a new program. At the University of California, Santa Cruz, I decided to have a program that was called the Biology of Big. While everybody else was going molecular, cellular, making big bucks in biotech, I said, we are only going to study things that are bigger than humans. And we did two different things. We had the animals tell their stories. And so a lot of times the animals I work with wear instrumentation. The pictures you see right there are animals that are actually wearing video cameras. And it allows us to see the world from their perspective. And the other part of it is just as critical. We bring students in and I pair them with animals and have them work day after day with these animals to begin a partnership so that they understand each other and each other's needs. And here are some of the things that we found. So, um, wildlife, whoops, I didn't do that. <laughs> wildlife is slow. So this uh, lion has a camera on its chest. It's about ready to take its big move here. It's watching a tourist truck. There it is. He's moving his paw. He's getting ready. And it's like he's watching and watching, and then it's like, well, I think I'm just going to go right back to sleep. <laughs> and the, the truth is, when, when we're working with these animals, 90% of the time, and especially for African lions, it's pretty well spent in this position. Um, <laughs> truly the laziest animals I've ever worked with. Um, but, but, you know, for a lot of wildlife, it is truly, truly a slow kind of life. For, um, these are elephant seal tracks. And so wildlife has no boundaries. These are satellite tracks of elephant seals that were taken by Dan Costa and his group. And I want you to see where these animals are going. They start off at Año Nuevo and into Mexico. The entire Pacific Ocean is the playground for these animals. Imagine, imagine if we had fences in the ocean, the way that we've created fences in our lives and fences on land. These animals could never survive, and we never knew it. As scientists, we thought that elephant seals just occurred along the coast of California and Mexico. Not so. The entire ocean is their playground. 
The third thing that we've learned is wildlife is quiet. You're going to have to listen a little bit here, unless they have something to say. So you are going to see the perspective. This is a seal, Weddell seal, underneath the Antarctic ice. It's looking up at an ice crack, and you're going to hear, you'll see a seal first, and then you're going to hear the very first seal that comes by him. It's very sweet, and it's very nice. So now what's going to happen is the seal is waiting, and the thing that the seal wants to do, it's been diving now for almost 20 minutes, it's, hold, it's held its breath, and it wants to get to that light spot. That light spot is a breathing spot. Here's the competing seal, and here's what this animal had to say about the other one coming up. always sends a shiver down my spine. <laughs> it's just the greatest sound. You know, Seal made that thing, and I'm going, if I had earbuds in, I never would have heard it. I mean, it's just incredible. All right, so the most important lesson that we've learned by interacting with animals has been, if you are slow, if you are quiet, if you have no boundaries, we have found that wild animals are actually attracted to us. Now, how many of you have a cat or a dog, and you are the one that feeds it and plays with it and washes it and takes it out and does all this work and wrestles with it, and it doesn't seem to like you as much as your wife or your husband or your friends. It seems attracted to anybody else but you. I can give you a clue right now. Just take a minute and do nothing. If you do nothing, you've entered into that animal's world, and chances are it's going to love you a lot more for just sitting still instead of just always frantically running around. Um, so yeah, there's one clue about animals. So I'm going to ask you to engage. Engage into the big world of animals, and this is what's in the natural world. The natural world is generally pretty quiet, it's peaceably slow, and it is without boundaries. And the problem is, these are the very qualities that we have let slip through our hands in our frantic, crazy lives that we run every single day. The, your image of animals right now are basically built on these discovery channel you know, kinds of frantic kinds of activities that they show animals doing, running around and killing things or these kinds of animal um, shows that you see where the animals are jumping and leaping and doing all of this work. And the truth is, that couldn't be further from the truth in terms of what the natural world is all about. And so I'd like you to enter into that world. In fact, I'd like you to break out of your cubicles, try and do it at least, I don't know, every day would be great, but if you could do it once a week, Go and find a view that is absolutely clear of anything man-made. And if you have to, just look up at the sky, because that's a great place to try and do this. And take out the earbuds and just listen to your heartbeat. And listen as it mixes with the pulse of nature. Because if you do that, you are going to enter into what this animal is feeling out in the wild. And so as for me, what we're doing is um, actually creating a, a, another lab, an integrative teaching program where I'm bringing people in with animals because I feel that we are learning so much between our different species. And we're learning just the most amazing secrets from them. And I'm going to give you one of the secrets right now. Remember that big brain that I just told you about for the sperm whale? Well, whales... Different species of whales can live for 100 to 200 years, and they do it without stroke, without Alzheimer's disease, or any of the other neurodegenerative diseases that plague the human race. What if we could take advantage of those kinds of secrets? It'd be just amazing. 
And so I ask you guys just to um, engage in big, engage in the natural world. And if you do that, if you learn to live and breathe and act big, you're going to survive, and so are the animals of the world and our planet. And I thank you very much for your time. <laughs>